see that? It's a carpet of food. And it wouldn't be there if it weren't for humans. We change the environment, use enormous resources, specialized equipment over vast areas of land, and it's all for... and I have a lot in common. We eat food. And there are a lot of us. We eat a lot of food. Enough to fill buildings like these. Now, it wouldn't be possible for all of us to eat if we didn't raise our food on farms. Tons of it. This is wheat. It'll be turned into pastry and pasta. You know, uh, spaghetti and donuts. Now, every grain, almost every bit of the food almost any of us ever eats is grown and gathered on a farm. This is the farm. So we grow nothing but food! It's science! Take a look at this. It's our very large human food land area of science. Now, ancient people used to roam vast areas of land, perhaps 25 square kilometers, to find enough food to eat for a year. An ancient person, uh, like this one, might have been a hunter-gatherer scavenger, hunted small animals gathered fruits and vegetables, and scavenged for food that other animals left behind. But over thousands of years, humans figured out how to turn land like this into land like this. It's a farm. They're crops, plants that have been planted in regular patterns to take best advantage of the nutrients in the soil and the amount of water that's available. On this farm, they're even raising some crops just to feed animals. Now, the animals and the crops are both used by humans for food. Now, a couple of centuries ago, it took an area of land about 400 meters by 400 meters in North America to feed a family, about 40 acres. But now, around the turn of the 21st century, we're able to feed a person using modern farms with an area of land that's just 50 meters by 50 meters. We've gone from 25 square kilometers to half a soccer field. See, farming is a science. Humans have figured out better and more efficient ways to farm. supermarket? I don't think so! Try the farm, animal! Food comes from farms! Food comes from farms! You heard me! Food comes from farms! This is a pineapple plantation, a place where people plant and pick pineapples. Good, yummy, yummy. 
Now, pineapple plants are prickly, so pineapple pickers take precautions. They wear protection. Now, you may ask, how does a pineapple picker pick a pineapple? Well, a pineapple picker picks a pineapple with a push. Then you give the top a twist. This part of the pineapple is the peduncle. This cap is the crown. So how does a pineapple planter plant pineapples? Well, you pierce the plastic and you make a cup in the crust for the crown with this kooky contraption. So you may ask, how many pineapples could a pineapple picker pick in a period of time? Fifteen. Well, uh, uh, oh, we're just going to have to address that later. That particular question, I don't know any more words that begin with P. Platypus, paper cut, pet rock. I just love corn on the cob. You, you ever seen them cartoons where they eat corn on the cob? It's like it's a typewriter. Ting! Well, of course, when you read real corn on the cob, it doesn't get that little bell noise or nothing, but, you know, it's still fun, and it's good. It's really good. As we all know, weather is very important to farming, and farming, as we all know, is science! Hmm, it's good. Let's see, wheat, corn, sugar, <laughs> along with a whole bunch of other ingredients. You know, I got this box at the store, but that's not where the cereal comes from. This grain was just gathered from a wheat field. First, it goes down. And it shoots along the ground, underground, then up there, high above, into those silos. They're called elevators, because the grain's got to get elevated to get in. The sugar came from here. It's growing on an island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It gets mixed with grain from the middle of North America. Wild. It's packed into bite-sized cereal shapes and shipped to you and you and you and you and you. All these ingredients are raised on farms. They're harvested and then put together. Where does food come from? The shopping center. Where does the shopping center get it? I don't know. Does it come from farms? Yeah, I guess so. To grow food on land, you have to eat dirt. Please consider the following. You might not have thought about it, but everything that lives on a farm depends on plants. And plants live in dirt. It has to be good dirt. Rich topsoil like this is full of living things. Bugs, worms, roots, dead leaves. It's all part of what we in the soil business call organic material. Organic matter is the remains of plants and animals. Organic material is stuff that came from organisms. Organic organisms, you with me? Soil like this is perhaps 10% uh, organic material. The rest is sand and rocks. Now the kinds of nutrients that plants take up through their roots comes from the organic material. But without that 5, 10, or 20% of organic material like this, hardly anything would grow here. So the plants need the topsoil to grow. It takes centuries for topsoil to form. That's because it takes a long time for living things to gnaw away at dead things and turn them into the kind of nutrients that plants can use. Whenever we eat plants that are grown in soil, in a way, we're eating dirt. Thank you for joining me on Confear the Fallen. Bill, you're not gonna... Oh, Bill. <laughs> in each acre of this farmland, there may be as many as 50,000 earthworms. They are constantly loosening hard soil by eating their way through it, opening the soil to air and water necessary for the growth of plants. The earth eaten by earthworms is deposited in small mounds called castings around the openings of their burrows.
The castings, a form of manure, help to fertilize the soil. I'm Ray DeVries. I'm an organic farmer. Some of the foods that we grow here, there's leek and there's carrots and there's zucchinis and these are flying saucers. Nah, just kidding. Organic farming means that we don't use herbicides and we don't use pesticides. And not only that, we have really happy worms. Here we have kale. And what our kale has is aphids. Aphids are bugs that really like living on kale. The thing is, we don't like aphids on our food. So what we spray with is soap and vegetable oil mixed with water. The soap kills the bug, and the vegetable oil makes the soap stick to the bug. It only kills the aphids, the bad bugs, and it allows the good bugs to keep right on living. And because it's just soap and oil, it doesn't hurt us either. This is what organic farming is all about. From healthy soil, we get healthy food. Hey, Pa. Hey, yeah, Ma. Did you know that farming changes the environment? How so, Ma? Well, just think about all the water it takes to raise a single field of hay. OK. Ma, I'll thank you. Crops are plants. They need three things to grow. Carbon dioxide from the air, light from the sun, and water. Water is the key. If crops aren't getting enough water from rain, farmers will find ways to bring water to the crop. It's called irrigation. Irrigation can change dry land into fertile farmland. To get the millions of liters of water that we need to irrigate crops, we go to all kinds of trouble. We build huge dams, giant reservoirs, or drill very deep wells. Irrigation is a big part of farming. Farming changes the environment. This is uh, soft white wheat. It'll be shipped to the Orient to be made into noodles. These are peas right here. We grow peas on the farm with corn and a whole bunch of other crops. After we harvest these, send them to the uh, cannery where they can them and then they freeze them and put them in the supermarket. This is an ear of corn that will be ready in about two weeks and we have to hand pick this out of our little patch. This is what my sister calls a little patch. We've got to pick a hundred dozen every day. The energy we get from food began as light energy from the sun. You don't have to live on a farm to be a farmer. Just try this. Fold a paper towel and get it wet. Then put your paper towel in a plastic bag with a seed, like a lima bean. Now put that in your pocket. And in a couple of days, your seed's gonna sprout. Try it a lot of different times with different seeds in different pockets. But you're gonna wanna be careful because you don't want things to get too out of control. Wheat kernels were sealed with dead kings deep inside the ancient pyramids. They lay untouched for 5,000 years, 50 centuries. Scientists excavated these seeds and cultivated them. They grew. The seeds grew into new wheat plants. Growth. The seeds in the pyramids must have been alive for 5,000 years. In fact, we're still getting bread from their offspring today. It just depends where you bite into the life cycle. This is winter rye, like rye bread. 
but no one's going to ever eat this crop. The farmer planted it to hold the soil through the winter time. In the spring, the farmer will plow it into the ground to make organic material for the next crop. See, it's just one more way that farmers have figured out how to grow more food on their land. There's all kinds of people involved. There's botanists, agronomists, geneticists, entomologists, farmers, all working together to manage the soil, the amount of water, and to plant the right kind of crops so we can grow food efficiently. See, farming is science. Hey, Pa. Yeah, Ma. Guess what time it is? What time is it, Ma? It's harvest time. <laughs> and now here's Bill Nye. You know the old saying, lab coats don't grow on trees. That's right. They grow in fields. This is a cotton field. And these are cotton plants. See, it's a farm where we're not raising food, we're raising clothes. <laughs> It's time for Mind Your Manners with Billy Kwan. Today's episode, Harvest of Fury. <laughs> ah, at last, I have grown the perfect tomato on my uh, urban farm. Hey, who put these dirt clods over here on my garden? Get these out of here. Oh, it is huh? so plump and succulent and perfect and... Oh, oh, get oh, this out. Oh, oh, my very God. Oh! Ha! You have destroyed my masterpiece! Huh? Your careless clod throwing has turned my beautiful tomato into ketchup! Oh, you want to see some farming, huh? Well, hey, check this out. Oh, she is very good with a farm implement. I'm moving to the country, gonna eat a lot of farm food. I'm moving to the country, Gonna eat me a lot of farm food. Moving to the country. Gonna eat a lot of farm food. Moving to the country. Gonna eat a lot of farm food. Farm food's grown with a plan. Raised and planted by humans. Riding tractories around. And no matter where I might stay, I'll eat farm food every day. Get it down at the grocery. Moving huh. to the country, gonna raise a lot of farm food. Moving to the country, gonna raise a lot of farm food. Get ready for a mulching. Implement this. Bushels of farm food, farm food for me. Acres of farm food, farm food you see. Truckloads of farm food, farm food for me. Millions of farm foods, farm foods you see. Oh, look out! Boys and girls, be a good tomato, or I will weed you out. Hey, hey, over here. Hi, Bill. I'm here with some of the largest living things on Earth. Okay. You know what they are? I'll give you three guesses. Uh, elephants. One. Uh, whales. Two. Elephants. Three. That was going to be my next guess, Bill. Bill Nye, the science guy. is a property of matter. Bill, 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 Bill. Bill, 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 Bill,
So it has a roof, some rooms, a floor, and a basement. You clipped in there? Why do I have to be clipped in, Bill? Good. Bill. Now, the basement of a forest is called oh, boy. a subfloor. That's where the roots of trees grow. Then there's the floor. That's the ground. That's where a lot of animals and small plants live. Then above that, just like a building has stories, a forest has what we call the understory. Now, the understory is this part right here. Now, above the understory is the roof of the forest, the top. That's what we call the canopy. That's where the sun is. And that's why most trees have their leaves and needles up near the top, up in the canopy with the sun. Now, each level of the forest, the subfloor, the floor, the understory, and the canopy, is different living things. And they all live together to make the forest ecosystem. So they're living things living in and around living things. Trees! It's a forest! Isn't it great? I've seen this guy. Sometimes he's pretty funny. That's some science right there. Forest, forest, that old growth. Science, new forestry, wilderness. Trees! 698, 700, 701, Oh, this is a very old redwood tree stump. This was cut down a long time ago. Now, you know when someone has a birthday, you put one candle on the cake for every year that the person is old. Well, a tree grows a little bit every year. It makes another very thin layer. And then when the tree's cut down, we can count these rings, just like counting candles on a birthday cake, and get an idea of how old the tree is in years. Now, this tree is very old. It has about 1,200 rings. 1,200 years! 1,200 years! I mean, do you understand? I mean, that's 1,200 years old. And some of them are 2,000 years old. That's way older than the United States. I mean, that's way before Copernicus or Christopher Columbus or... 1,000! 200 years old, are you with me? I mean, it's a long time ago. People were barely speaking English. I mean, nobody would say, boy, those tree rings are cool. But you know, they are cool. <laughs> oh, I've lost my place. Oh, fine. I come out here, I count rings, I lose my place. I mean, look at it. <sighs> All right. It's around, it was around 700. It was around 700. Let me try this again. see the four levels of the forest with this model. Down here is the subfloor. This is where the soil is that plant and tree roots grow in. Then here's the floor. This is where we can walk around or go bowling. And then here is the understory, the small plants that aren't as high as the big trees. And up here is the canopy. The canopy is where the sun's energy enters the forest. So at each level, the canopy, the understory, the floor, and the subfloor, there are different types of living things. And they all live together to make up the forest ecosystem. So see, it's not a bad little model. Ah, it's a nice model. Oh, no, wait, wait, this, this doesn't belong here. This is a can of peas. <laughs> and this is a canopy. See, <laughs> not... <sighs> Forests are great places for hiking, stunning nature, and camping. But what makes them forests is that their place is mostly covered by trees. Energy and nutrients in a forest flow in a cycle. Take a look. Sunlight comes into the canopy where leaves and needles on trees grow. After a while, they fall down to the floor where they get broken down into nutrients. They get taken up by the roots of plants and trees and make their way back up here again. So you see, it's a cycle and it's driven by energy from the sun. Ah. <sighs> Some peas need a ton of water a day. That's how much a car weighs. And check this out. That water has a long way to go to get to the top. Want to see how trees do it? Then put some celery in some colored water. In a day, you'll see the color in the leaves. Now try this. Put another one under a lamp, like it's a sunny day. Put another one by a fan, a windy day. Put another one in a bag. That's a really humid day. <clears throat> do plants move water faster or slower when it's sunny, windy, or really humid? Try it! Take a look at this. It's the forest floor, and it's littered with 
twigs and pine needles and leaves and pine cones, all kinds of stuff. Looks good, doesn't it? High in fiber, too. Well, where does this stuff come from? Well, if something like a tree falls down in the forest, it's wood. It's hard, like that. See? But take a look at this one. This tree's been sitting here probably uh, well over a hundred years. And look how soft it is. You can just pry right into it. That's because in here are fungi and insects and bacteria, which are breaking the tree down into soil. They're decomposing it. They're the decomposers. So the decomposers turn dead stuff into soil, the forest floor for the forest to grow in. And look, here are brand new trees growing right here. No decomposers, no forest floor, no forest. Universal Pictures presents a tale so terrifying it's been buried for years. But now, it's sneaking up beneath your sneakers. It's the incredible Voyage to the Bottom of the Trees. Thrill to the three levels of dirt. The dead leaves of litter. The moldy leaves of duff. And of course, horror has a new name. Humus. The dead decomposed leaves that now look like dirt. This summer, take a voyage to the bottom of the trees. Oh, man. I'm looking at the tallest trees in the world, the redwoods on the west coast of the United States in California. Some of these trees are over 100 meters high. That's like a 25-story building high. That's tall. These trees are over 2,000 years old. I mean, that's older than your parents, that's older than your grandparents, that's older than the year zero. They're part of what we call an old growth redwood forest. And some of them are over 80 meters high. They're big! Over here. These are logs that have come out of the forest. And this log was brought in after the loggers harvested it, put it on a truck, and it's here at the sawmill. The logs will then be looked at very carefully, and lumber will be made. Some of that lumber will go into a home, some may go into a fence, a deck, a picnic table. One of the main things that we get from forests is wood. Imagine, if you will, a world without wood. In a world without wood, there'd be no tool handles. Ah, 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 ah. Picture frames. Or uh, baseball bats. or rocking chair. No wooden fences. Isn't wood great? Oh. There's your world without wood comic. Right there. Thank you.
Forests are like buildings with different levels. The top level, a canopy, is kind of like the roof. It's where vines and leaves and moss are. This is the understory, below the canopy. This is where the little trees, shrubs, and other plants and animals live of the forest. If I lived in the forest, this is where I'd live too. This is the forest floor. It's also where decomposers live, like worms. They help break down dead plants, like this tree, and turn it into nutrient-rich soil. Finally, the basement, or the subfloor. It's where all the dirt and roots are. The real underground of the forest. Scientists believe that this redwood tree is over 600 years old. You know what else? Scientists believe this is the tallest tree on Earth. It's over 100 meters high. Whoa. Twenty years from now, there'll probably be a lot of trees. We'll have trees all around this area. And we'll just have a great place for hikers to come. Uh, this looks good now. It'll be a great recreation area and a place for animals and people to mix. This whole place here was once a forest, and um, the people of our age used, used these trees for things that we use today, like paper and houses and lumber. So when you plant your tree, you want to make sure that the roots are going straight down the ground? When you're planting a tree, you have to keep the roots straight down so that it grows straight up. You want to plant it in some moist soil so it has some water so it can grow. We need a price check on cones and a cleanup on humus, please. Forests are full of living things because forests are full of food. To insects and animals, a forest is like a great big supermarket. <laughs> The old forest floor isn't as smooth as a grocery aisle. Anyway, in a forest, you might find beetles eating bark and birds eating beetles. Uh, birds also eat berries and nuts. Anyway, a forest isn't just full of trees. No, it's full of food, and that's why it's full of life. Paper plastic. Oh, I brought my own. Thanks. Listen, can you tell me, where's the... Uh, Fungus. I'll tree. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tree. <laughs> you need a home that you can be proud of. That's why we at 20th Century offer the Forest Dwelling Plan, a safe wooded community on four levels. Tour the luxurious dirt level. Ferns and baby trees line the floor. Or you and your family can reside between the treetops and the ground at the understory. And nothing is more exciting or affordable than experiencing the dense and leafy top of the forest, the canopy. Call today for special rates for vacancy on the subfloor, our new secluded subterranean dwelling where a family can... Different kinds of forests are found all over the world. These are old growth cypress trees. They grow in swamps in Florida. They've been here several hundred years. Now take a look. The floor and the subfloor and the understory are underwater. And the roots of the cypress trees are set up to allow them to grow here. It grows in a wetland. This is a forest growing in water. This is the understory of a forest in East Texas. You can see the understory is thick. There's lots of plants. And the trees are deciduous trees. They shed their leaves in the fall. And up there is the canopy. Now, still, the forest is all based on trees, things living and growing on and around trees. Like, look at the vines. And, and here's a large spider who's making a living up there. Man, everything's big in Texas. Everything. This is a fog forest. It gets moisture from rain, but it also gets moisture from fog. 
Every morning, fog comes into the forest, and it keeps the leaves and needles up high in the trees moist. They don't lose nearly as much water during the day as they would otherwise. Also, the fog condenses on the leaves and needles and branches up high in the trees and falls to the forest floor. Just like rain, fog forests are unusually green and beautiful. Trees? No trees. We're standing on the timber line. The timber line is a place above which trees don't grow. The soil is too rocky. The summers are too short. The winters are too long. And there isn't enough water here. Also, the air is thin. Now, this tree right here is growing right on the timber line. And it might be about 30 years old. See how small it is? That's because it's hard for a tree to live this high up in the mountains. The forest stops at the timber line. I'm Nalini Nadkarni and I'm a forest ecologist. I study forests and I'm one of the few scientists that climbs up to the forest canopy to study what's going on there. All this equipment clanks a lot, but it's actually pretty darn simple. And it's sort of like getting into your underwear in the morning. This is called, I call this a master caster. It's just a wrist rocket that you can get in an Army Navy store, mounted on an aluminum rod with a fishing reel underneath. Put a weight on it. And it's an invention to get the line up over the branch into the tree. Here goes the rope. Up and over. You know, forests are cool. Everything about forests are cool. But the coolest part about all forests everywhere is the canopy. Okay, up we go. Now we're getting to the upper canopy. And this is really the exciting part. Because this is where so few scientists have studied before. You see, down there on the forest floor, people have pretty much figured things out. They've been studying the forest floor and, and the understory for centuries. But the canopy has only been studied for maybe 10 years. And so that's why this is called the last biotic frontier, because people just don't know much about it. And that's what makes it exciting for studying up here, because we don't know much about it. When you look at trees, you might not think they're like us. They don't run around for one thing. They don't eat. They make their own food from sunlight without going anywhere. They just grow. Think about this. When trees go to reproduce, to make new young trees, they start out with seeds barely bigger than the eraser on a pencil. And when humans have babies, we all start out as cells barely bigger than the point on a pencil. Now, why do living things do that? Why do living things have life cycles from tiny or small to big or very big? Whoa. Trees are big. And if a tree had to have its offspring full grown, well, trees would be huge. And it would be hard for trees to spread their offspring around. See, right now, trees get help from animals like squirrels. They carry the seeds, the nuts, to other parts of the forest. But if a squirrel had to carry a full-grown tree on its back... Death. See these dandelions? This one's at the end of its life cycle. But it's not really the end. These seeds will land, and they may sprout into new dandelions, which will grow and make seeds and die. Then it starts all over again. It's a cycle of life. Things are born, they grow, reproduce, and die. See, trees need water and sunlight to grow. They're big and tough, but they all start out only this big. When they're small, seedlings, they're competing with each other and other small plants in the forest, like ferns. Plants like these can't get as big as trees. Their stems aren't made of stiff enough stuff. Their roots aren't robust enough to reach down deep in the soil. And their fronds aren't big enough to reach up and out as far as trees can. 
but they grow fast. Faster than trees. They compete by having shorter life cycles. While the tree seedlings struggle to grow, the fern uh, sporlings grow into big old happy green fern plants. Now some of the seedlings manage to grow fine through the low canopy of ferns. And some of the ferns manage to grow with a dappled light from above. But see, it's not just about space on the ground, light and water. It's about time. It's about life cycles. How fast they grow depends on what resources are available to them and at what time of year. See, life cycles have been worked out over millions and millions of years of trial and error, and it's still going on. That's a lot of life cycles. Thank you for joining me on Consider the Following.